Hey. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Young, and my co-host and moderator is Trish Takemoto. Uh, welcome to this, uh, I think, 30, 62nd or 63rd version of the Yale Career Panel's Candid View of Professions. And this was started 12 years ago by a group of us, primarily because as great a, as Yale is as an academic institution, et cetera, one of the things uh, that it's very hard to get are really candid assessments of different professions. So we started out with legal and, and, and medical, and it was very popular. So we continued on, and now 12 years later, we're going through various ones. I think today's uh, session is going to be a, a candid view of alternative investing. And we're very, very privileged to have three really wonderful panelists with us. And what's unique also is that uh, they, they, they have careers that have crossed over different parts of alternative investing, whether it's family offices or hedge funds or private equity. So I think we have an unusually competent panel here to talk about the, the topic of alternative investing. Um, I, I will uh, moderate for uh, the first two questions and then turn it over to Trish. Um, but I also want to mention about our next upcoming event. Uh, we're going to try something new, and that is going to be Yale Career Panels adv adv and ad Advice and Networking event. It's going to be on October 21st at 8 o'clock Eastern Time. And what we're going to do is we're going to have a number of experienced Yaleys who are in different professions, and they're going to be available in an electronic ballroom seated at different tables. And the students and young alumni essentially can just go from table to table and talk to the one the people they want to. Uh, and uh, we've used this technology before. It really works well. And uh, it'll really, uh, there's no speeches or anything. It'll just give you an opportunity to pick a, a couple of people who you want to talk to. And in advance of the event, everyone who registers will get a list of all of the quote advisors. So you can decide who you want to go and talk to. So we hope uh, many of you will find uh, it worthwhile to join that event. Again, it's October 21st at eight o'clock Eastern time. And it's going to be Yelp Group panels uh, and advice in networking events. Uh, and we'll be sending uh, invitations out. So uh, uh, this 8 is going to be done. 8, 8 p.m. Uh, uh, this is going to be done as a fireside chat. And I think the first two questions, and oh, by the way, at the very end, uh, Trish will leave time for Q&A. And the way that you should ask a question is either type it in the Q&A chat box or the regular chat box. And Trish will be able to see the question and she'll direct it to you know the, the panelists. So uh, I, I think the first thing I want to ask is really, uh, not everyone knows the term alternative investing. Not everyone knows what a hedge fund is or a family office or private equity. So let's start out for the benefit of the audience. And if our panelists, in, in no particular word, it could be all of you or one of you, if perhaps you can give sort of your definition of any one of those three. Danya, I know you are, you're running a family office, right? Is that right? Uh, yes, I run a multifamily office, OCIO, focusing okay. on Asian so families. So I'm going to pick on you because all the three of you are being so bashful. So could you define for the audience, how would you define what a family office is? Um, well, family office, well, like, I guess the first question you asked about alternatives, uh, which is really uh, an asset class that is differentiated from the traditional fixed income or equity. I used to work at BlackRock where um, asset management as a term are more known for traditional asset classes that's easily accessible for both institutional and retail investors. Um, uh, and, and when we talk about multi-asset in the industry, ballpark is also referring to more liquid asset, which again goes yeah. back to fixed income uh, and public equity. And alternatives, uh, with the exception of hedge fund, and I'm sure like Rob and Greg will talk more about, about that, but um, 
there's a lot of illiquid asset within alternatives. It's called alternatives for a reason because it's typically only reserved for larger institutions and, and accredited investors. And um, that goes back to the notion of family office. How does a family office become a family office? It typically accumulates wealth through some sort of an exit. It could be they build a business in technology or real estate or traditional manufacturing, and then their company got listed or acquired. And it could be multi-generational wealth as well, especially if we're talking about North America or um, European families. But when we, when we talk about Asian families, which is where I spend most of my energy and where my families come from, some of those are still the first generation or second generation, but usually they accumulated their wealth through building some sort of a business and then had a meaningful exit. Uh, some of the families are still running their operating business. Some of them have entirely exited and focusing on running the family office in the form of an investment entity. So when uh, in the industry, when people talk about family offices, it can be viewed as a typical institutional LP, but the decision maker are typically ultimately family members that are essentially ultra high net worth individuals, but they have built a dedicated entity and run it in an institutional fashion like any other uh, institutional LPs, like what I used yeah. to deal with at BlackRock, okay. like Silver Wealth Fund, uh, Central Bank's right. uh, endowment foundations. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So basically it's money managed by a, usually family money, where they really could choose where they want to, uh, you know, invest, and they can invest in a lot of different ways. Greg, do you want to take a shot at uh, defining private equity? Greg, you're muted. You're muted. Okay. Greg, can you maybe help the audience understand what private equity is? Oh, private equity is just another uh, of what the um, an alternative asset class. Um, the the uh, I, I would have said in answer to your question uh, of what is traditional versus alternative, it started out that in the old world, and I'm qualified to do that because I've been in there here for almost 50 years, it started out that uh, uh, you went long only investing in registered securities, so stocks publicly traded or uh, bonds. And basically, the composition of portfolios were long only uh, investments in publicly traded equities or fixed income. Uh, and, and then, uh, so it was focused on that. And secondly, uh, the method in which you traded them. So if you uh, did a long and shorting on public equities, uh, you could compose it and, and create uh, an argument that you were an asset class or you decided to protect your upside or enhance your, uh, I mean, enhance your upside or protect your downside through options trading and option overlays on public equities, uh, you could call yourself a hedge fund. Now, the advantage of that, if you called yourself a hedge fund, the second part of it was the, uh, uh, the fees that you charge, which included incentive fees, which lured a lot of people into it. And because... Uh, the argument for that was uh, having skin in the game and then also generating alpha, which is above market returns, and taking a share of it. So uh, that lured people who felt that through various trading mechanisms, they could uh, do that. Um, okay, that was all liquid assets. And basically, I would say hedge funds are liquid assets, variations on trading traditional assets with the various overlays and so forth. Uh, so uh, then you got to unregistered uh, assets or private companies. SEC allowed uh, people to put out equities to certain uh, individuals who were considered sophisticated and you could then uh, uh, invest, you know, people invested family offices invested in companies, but when people decided to try to syndicate it into pools, they um, want to do that. And the SEC allows that uh, if you don't have public offerings. Uh, the So private equity came out. Now, uh, private equity is actually segregated the general class into venture capital and private equity uh, stages of investing. 
which as you might guess over time got more and more complicated so now you have seed investors you have venture you have early venture you have late venture you have growth equity uh you have um uh you have private private equity which is grown up companies that are usually cash flow positive may be uh producing profits actually uh and uh that is the you know private equity class so further down stage uh and that would be private equity uh they can be some very large companies in fact you can take public companies private and then your private yeah. equity you see some big funds doing that but also private equity by the way oh first of all i i do want to make a statement which is there's a special connection between yale and alternative investing because yale's endowment fund was revolutionary in going into alternative investments i think we those everyone on this panel knows that and in fact that was what they 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 really pioneered that among the endowments and why Yale got very superior returns for a long, long time. And that it became very, very, uh, you know, famous. Uh, well, we don't want to spend our entire time just defining the industry. So maybe let's go on. And, you know, we're very lucky because all three of the panelists and I myself, I was in venture capital and so forth. So I, I had experience myself, but um, maybe uh the next thing we want to do is uh maybe uh if each of you could take a minute or two and just say which of these categories have you were you, in your career were you involved with because in each of case uh all of you have been in more than one right so rob do you want to start out and say of these three i know you've been in more than one right so just tell <laughs> us which of those the three that we've highlighted, uh, you know, were, were part of your career. Sure. Uh, thanks, uh, Peter, for inviting me to join this panel. So I've spent my career in both private and public. Uh, so, you know, I, I started my career in private equity was more than Stanley couple partners mm -hmm. doing mostly very late stage and a little bit growth stage investments, late stage, meaning, Leverage buyouts, LBO. So that essentially means, and this for an audience who uh, don't know a lot about our industry, you borrow money from the banks or from other funding sources and use that money <laughs> to buy a typically large, mature business. And as Greg mentioned earlier, that generates cash flow. Um, so you can, you know, buy a public traded company and take it private. And after that, because the company does generate cash flow. You can use that cash flow to pay down the debt that you borrow from the banks or other funding sources. And once you paid off the debt, you be you basically own all the equity, and that's how you generate you know all the returns. So even if the company doesn't grow much from the time you buy it out till the day that you exit, but simply paying off the debt, because typically the debt has a lower cost of capital versus the equity piece and that's how you generate return now and the pioneer and the pioneer in that the famous company called kkr right they were the first ones to do that and they did lbos of small fallen angels that used to be the term right yeah yep, that's so right. you did it, you you're you've been involved with both public and private but generally late late stage right yeah very late stage now for the last 10 years you know, I I I, uh, I spend my time on the public side, uh, so that's really you know simply putting a very simple term or buying and selling stocks. So we're betting on the stocks that will go up. In our term, in our industry term, we call that go long, a company, or a stock. If you want to make a bet that the stock of the company going to go down, and we use a term we call short, a company, or a stock. So we do both. So we're bidding company that will go up in value at the same time. We're bidding company that might go down in value. And by capturing that, um, the spread we can generate return uh, for our investors. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, in these recent years, I would say there's a growing um, cohort of companies that do across private and public. 
And the, 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 best, the best known example is actually Warren Buffett. So his holding company, Berkshire Hathaway, they don't care it's private or public. Mm -hmm. If there's a great opportunity in the public equity market, he will go after that. He actually put half of his money, Berkshire Hathaway's money, in one company, one stock, which is Apple. At the same time, if he sees good opportunity, now he can just take a private from the public equity market <laughs> or, or just like buy out a, a family business from private investors, he can do that too. Now, obviously- And he bought, and he bought Geico, for example, and he's been holding it for a long time. Yeah, yeah that's right. That's right. So now, obviously, he is, he's massive, but there's still a lot of firms right now that would do both. So, you know, normal times, they would just invest in company, let's say Apple. But when the opportunity come up that they think, okay, the valuation is very attractive, they can work with other funding sources and just like buy out the entire business and just keep it. Um, so so there's, a, there's a, now the, the, the definition between private and public are getting uh, more and more blended. Uh, there's like a lot of uh, funds could do both. Now, what I'd like to do now is, uh, since it's now already, you know, 20 minutes in, is two things. One, I'd like to turn the moderate, the you know, moderation over to Trish Takemoto. But also now we're going to go into the guts of two things. One is, where are these professions heading, good and bad, right? Because all professions have good things and bad things. But the other is, the many, many of the remaining questions are, what kind of person does well in each of these sectors and what, you know, characteristics, personality, skills. So I'm going to turn it over to Trish. Uh, I'm going to uh, 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 disappear and let her take over. And uh, so the next is really, the next question really is, uh, uh, you know, where are these professions heading, good and bad? Trish, go ahead. I'm unmuting myself, sorry. Um, Danya, you want to uh, comment on, on uh, for instance, family offices? Are they growing? Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm probably going to address this question in a broader fashion. So okay. I actually started off my career at, at BlackRock, one of the largest um, as a managers in the world, but I joined in 2008. That was like right in the middle of the last financial crisis. So at the time, BlackRock as a firm was very much a fixed income shop because we also was talking about different asset classes and where you're thinking about your career uh, trajectory and kind of the good and bad in different profession. So by joining a larger institutional platform, be it buy side BlackRock or like, like Rob started off in Credit Suisse and then Morgan Stanley, that's more sell side, but investment work, um, we typically receive pretty comprehensive training. Um, family offices typically are, are, are very lean in team setup and um, the professionals a family office would recruit would have already years of experiences under its belt. Not to say they don't recruit entry level candidates. There's also internship opportunities at different kinds of family offices, but from the scale of recruitment effort and how much training you would get, um, I would still recommend right off the back uh, out of college or grad school to maybe start your career uh, in, in a bigger institutional level platform. But even within the mo um, family office sector, there's obviously single family office um, for example, Michael Bloomberg has a family office here in New York called Willett Advisor. We also have uh, Yale alumni actually working at a family office like that. And in, in that specific case, um, she also have worked in investment bank and large private equity shops and fintech VC firms before eventually landing a specific investment role uh, at uh, Willett Advisor, Michael Bloomberg's family office. That's a multi-billion level family office. So typically, when we talk about single family office, um, you really need to understand the AUM they're working with. The larger the AUM, the more capability they have in terms of hiring 
uh, quality, uh, high quality candidates and and um, uh, approaching different at, uh, asset classes in a dedicated fashion. If it's a smaller mm -hmm. single family office, for example, only 100, 200 million, that uh, mm -hmm. sounds like a big number, but for in the institutional landscape, that's not a lot, then they typically wouldn't be able to hire dedicated asset class professionals. They may have uh, a CIO, mm -hmm. maybe a department head, and that's it. Um, so if you want a larger platform, maybe go for a multi-family office instead of a single family. And multi-family office in the landscape of North America are typically RAAs, registered investment advisors. And one thing, if you're in the industry, you might have noticed in the last couple of years is that there's tremendous consolidation, meaning larger platforms acquiring mid-size and smaller platforms to continue to grow. Another Yelly I know um, who started off her career at McKinsey, which is consultant career track, ended up joining a, um, a, a fast growing RIA, registered investment advisor, multifamily office platform. And the reason being her former uh, boss at McKinsey um, essentially was hired by that platform to, to grow uh, their platform by again, acquiring um, other similar, but maybe smaller uh, and, and covering different regions of the type of RAAs. So when a platform is in the trajectory of fast growing, they need all kinds of talents, not just investment mm -hmm. professionals, but also uh, people who can manage client relationship, people who can do operations, pe people who can also do sales and marketing mm -hmm. uh, that can help to, to further enhance the, the pl platform, including operational excellency. So I think- mm -hmm. um, you, like, I'm glad you mentioned McKinsey because Greg was at McKinsey for many years and as a consultant, and then he founded uh, Spring Mountain Capital. So, Greg, in your experience, how are these? Um... Yeah, so the um, taking on Danya's uh, advice, <clears throat> the um, if you want to get into uh, the area of alternative asset investing family offices, a good place to go is one of the large shops. You'll see the preponderance of people in our industry start from large shops. You might not spend a lot of time there, but but they have that base. And, and we hire from that base. And we have summer associates at our firm, but we don't hire a summer associate uh, for a permanent job. We only hire individuals who have gone through in the private equity side uh, two or three years of with investment banking experience because they have the training programs, uh, you know, the technicals. If you're going to take a look at cap tables or analyses, sensitivity tables, all of that, the models and the programs, it's, it's so much more efficient for us to pick up somebody who's gone through that. Secondly, they drive you crazy in terms of the hours they expect. So anybody who's done very well in investment bank, we know they're willing to put in the work. So um, the uh, uh, that's where you go. Now, the second piece of advice, though. As, is, did you sleep under your desk a lot, Greg? <laughs> uh, yeah. Now, the, the, uh, you have to do what you like. And when you pick the segment, the subject matter, as well as the, we find the best people are doing what they like. Now, the nice thing is that there, the when you look at the whole alternative asset, there's plenty of money. It's not that uh, there's a big flow. You're not, I think the majority of people are not here just to have a job. They want to find out, are there going to be big players in every one of those fields? And there are going to be very, very big players there. And they're, they will, the best jobs will go to the people who have, uh, the experience and prove that the um, uh, and the second thing is I think the shops that are very successful are not going to be one thing you'll see hedge funds that grow and there are examples of multi-billion dollar hedge funds uh, and the largest I think right now could be a millennium capital hedge fund just does trading I think it might be running 80 hundred billion dollars in the hedge fund uh, world, uh, the um, uh, there are others that that are at that level. There are also very big private equity shops. Uh, but if you take a look at wealth management, wealth management, and even the private equity shops are trying to do public equity investing, and and the public equity shops are trying to do private capital, so that you have this 
uh, stream. And the reason for that is <clears throat> the uh, entire alternative asset business is about the inefficient markets, right? Not where there are massive amounts, spotting the inefficiencies. And the inefficiencies occur not only in different kinds of trades that people don't do, but also in the how we've siloed it, things off from one stage to the next. There's very, very big inefficiency in that. And, and uh, the hedge funds, as well as private equity, are beginning to understand the inefficiencies and capturing those and going each way in terms of what they do. Family offices understand that and they create a blend uh, and uh, they'll invest, but they should, I, in my humble opinion, begin to invest in things that are, are exploring the crossover inefficiencies. Uh, you, if you look in, in the private equity uh, side, uh, uh, Rob talked about uh, leverage buyout, employing debt to leverage your investment. What we see in the hedge fund world in in uh, uh, companies is they will do an early stage investing. They'll bridge uh, because it's better to uh, have private debt, and they're lending. They're they're stepping in the place of a bank, but they're 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 factoring in twenty percent type annual rates of return from lending because they'll take a piece of equity, but they have control. If you blow it, they take your company away from you where they have tremendous power to do that. So, there, so um, what we see is, is whether or not your hedge fund, private equity, uh, or uh, family office. Now, RIAs are looking for people to who, who might do that and gener because they're, they're interested in people who generate alpha. Uh, now, they're looking for returns but the most capable returns above market are, are the alpha generators. Oh, for those of us who don't, what are RIAs? RIAs, Registered yes. Investment Advisors. I assume that's okay. you, Danya was also mentioning. Uh, and and the, those are, uh, you know, in the old world, you call them brokers, but that was traditional asset. And now you call them financial consultants. And some mm -hmm. of them have grown very big where they advise families with lots of capital on the deployment of that capital. And then uh, reasonably in order to create bulk and efficiencies of scale, uh, they roll them up and you have uh, a whole slew of RIA firms composed of individuals who manage the wealth, the selection of, um, of uh, investments for family offices modeled to their decisions. Uh, and some of them don't don't work with you unless unless you've got at least twenty five million dollars of capital, mm -hmm. uh, and and you'll see in all the big producers, uh, family offices with upwards of a hundred million dollars uh, of capital for deployment. Um, Rob, and your experiences, how um, when you transitioned from your Morgan Stanley, did you say? Um, and then to setting up your own firm. Um, why did you decide to do that? Was there some impetus, something happened or yeah. was so that your goal? I, so I moved from a Morgan Stanley couple of partners doing private yeah. equity um, to the, um, initially was a Tiger Cup doing public equity. In the last eight years, it was, uh, was a Jimmy Morgan asset management affiliate fund before spinning off and, and run my own shop. So the transition from private to public and this like more than 10 years ago, mm. it was a conventional route uh, because that, because that, because that time there's, you actually see a lot of the uh, uh, professionals working in this industry, moving from private equity to public equity. And the reason being that public equity, there's more volatility, meaning things can go up very high, very quickly. Or things could go down very quickly as well. Private equity, traditional sense, a more steady going. Uh, but for a lot of the young, ambitious people, they tend to think, okay, if I join the right firm, doing the right time, um, at the right place, maybe going to see that hockey stick in terms of return, 
And, you know, that goes with my uh, bonus number as well. So you see a lot of people uh, doing that transition. So I would definitely not be alone. I would definitely not a minority. A lot of people actually uh, do that. Now, things obviously have changed quite a lot because like public equity as an asset class, I was in the last like decade, especially the last like 70 years, has underperformed, has not done so well. And that's why you see some people actually left that space or some people decide not to leave private equity to join public equity. But things might change. So um, everything goes up and everything comes down right, on this. Um, what can you tell us uh, about the myths versus the realities? I mean, you were talking about um, when you first start out, you should go to a big institution and get the training and you're going to be working a lot. <laughs> um, but are there other things that um, people can expect um, when you're first starting out and then as your career proceeds? Have you found any um, sleeping under the desk or travel or actually having to go and inspect companies? Greg, you must have done that as at McKinsey. The, <laughs> um, you know, um, that, that's, why I, that's why I said earlier, um, you, you do what is, um, you should pick an area that you're really interested in. And, and uh, the fact of the matter is that you're, when you're investing, you're competing about against everybody else investing. And, and the unfortunate thing is it's a combination of not only whether you are a genius or, or smarter than them, but, but it is a factor of how hard you work. Uh, and uh, there, there's no question in my mind that the harder working person has a better chance of success. Now, I think you also have to like what you're doing. And if you don't like what you're doing, uh, you're not going to be really good at it either, right? So um, the the areas I've been in, which guided my selection of the areas, uh, I decided I did not want to do with the little. And so my entry into investing um, was looking at all the wonderful ideas that people were coming in. And, and I talked to my partners at McKinsey um, and in... Um, 1986, we created the McKinsey Investment Office. And uh, and that's what I decided to do. I did not go and look at individual security. I like reading and and uh, insofar as I had been chosen to also approve all of the uh, the engagements that McKinsey had, that they, you know, somebody had to go and say, yeah, that's consistent with our principles. It's economics. So I was already doing that. The uh, figured, okay, great, we'll take a look at investments and I'll approve those things and create a group to do that. And that's what I wanted to do. The The people we hired to actually run the investments, who spent a lot of time, they ended up getting paid more uh, because they produced the results, but that's because they really liked drilling down and doing that. So, and that was, that was okay with that because, you know, I had an overall nice blend. Uh, and it wasn't that I was paid poorly for it. The, uh, uh, you know, the nice thing about it is, and sometimes a bad thing is if you're successful, um, you're, you're not subject to a lot of constraints. So the, uh, uh, we, and then we found that there are ways to cut out the inefficiencies, namely, uh, how much people like myself want to charge you if you come to my hedge fund or something. So we mm -hmm. built our own staff and, and eventually um, uh, produced better returns. There's a Yale study, as a matter of fact, about the alpha generated by hedge funds. It, it goes back to, and it says, yes, hedge funds do generate alpha through their trading. Alpha is that return over the market rate. So it's your, in effect, your value added. But the Yale study, and you just look it up, it says the hedge funds took almost all the alpha in the form of fees. So net-net, they didn't really outperform. 
But in this business, when you have institutional investors, if you're 1% over what everybody else does, that's they're fine with that. And you're going to get a lot of their very big institutional mm -hmm. money, right? Uh, the extreme example was Jim Simons, the recently deceased Jim Simons. Uh, he knew from his trading that he could do to, so well that he could take a rate which the SEC would never have approved. He said, look, whatever... I generate with your money, I keep 50%, 50%. And he still delivered an outsized return. And so he got all the money. Eventually he knew there was capacity and he kicked everybody out. He said, I don't need your money anymore. Um, <laughs> why give away 50% of my profits was the way he looked at it. I should keep a hundred percent. So he became a family office, right? And, and that's what you see in terms of the stage of, uh, we see a lot of very, very successful hedge fund guys becoming family offices because they don't want to no, bother with the other people. They're lone wolves. Well, in general, though, what are the characteristics of someone who is is successful in these different alternative investing? I mean, you have to be a team player um, in some respects, or are you a person who, ha who would be looking at, um, you know, uh, SEC filings or um, a quant person. You have to and working to alone. Grow. You have to be a team player to start. Eventually, you have to lead, be a team leader. Uh, if you really want to get into creating your own fund, you have to be able to create teams. And so, you know, there are two aspects of a uh, team, which is very important. Whether in when we look in private equity, we look at groups that are teams. And a lot of times mm, you okay. see that people get their friends involved and that's not a team. The team is people with uh, commingled skill sets. You might disagree with them, but the commingled skill sets united by a common purpose. Mm -hmm. All right. And accountable to each other. Right. And then the second part of, of the whole thing was John Katzen's back book on the wisdom of teams was a book he wrote four years later about high performance teams and how to compose that. And, and if you're gonna make a lot of money and wanna be in the business, you have to be able to transition from being a member of a team and a very good member of a team to uh, a leader of a team. And you gotta personally spend time on your own development uh, as an individual and eventually into a leader. Trish, can Don, I get yes. in here? Yeah. Yes, I was um, gonna say. I, I do think personality plays a big role here. Um, on the buy side, investment work uh, is not is no easy undertaking. Um, for recent grad, a lot of people may still think about investment banking or equity research type of careers on the sell side. But if you think about it, you can bring a, a company IPO, you can help a company raise money. Uh, but the, but the at the end of the day, it's transaction business. You're not necessarily... Um, getting compensated for the actual result of whether or, or not the firm will perform longer term. But if you're on the investment side, be it hedge fund, you're getting this feedback loop on whether or not your decision is panning out uh, the day after, the month after, the year after. Um, you need to be able to handle that. If you work in um, one of those prestigious multi-strategy hedge fund shops, Millennium, for example, um, your position, your risk level is going to get cut uh, very quickly if you don't perform or if your drawdown is 5%. If it continues two months consecutively, your whole team might be cut. Um, it's a lot of pressure. So wow. especially when you're dealing with public markets um, on the hedge fund side, uh, especially working at one of those prestigious <laughs> shops, it's already very challenging to get in. Once you do get in, you really need to put in the work. It's not like sell side equity research, you rate buy, hold, sell on a certain company, but you're not necessarily responsible for the actual performance of that company. If you're on right. the buy side, you're recommended a buy if you're a research analyst and your PM end up taking a big position, your investor end up picking, taking a big position and it end up not performing. Do you sell now? Do you admit that you made a mistake? Or you? it's like the movie, The Big Short, you're shorting ahead of everybody else. You saw the writing on the wall, but you may be too early. Are you able to hold on to your position knowing what you know? So it's a, it's a really tough job. So um, Greg mentioned about 
having passion. Uh, I think aside from having passion and that level of curiosity and intellectual, um, uh, I guess, uh, a, a scale of intensity, it's also really about building up your expertise. Um, if you are to underwrite any specific opportunities, um, have you really put down the work? Have you mm -hmm. get the opportunity to talk to management? Uh, uh, on the public side, a lot of it is public information. Uh, all the analysis, you can you can run it. But on the private side, it's also about access to management. Um, if you've done channel checks, if there are a lot of unpublic information, a symmetry of information, have you spent time building the right relationships to actually have a deeper dive opportunity if you are doing um, the research on a certain sector or a certain company. Uh, so, so I would say like in general, on the public side, uh, the feedback will can be quite intense because you're gonna see the result relatively quickly. And do you have the personality to handle that? Can you sleep at night? That There's a reason I'm not really in the hedge fund business. I, yeah. I don't think as a person I can handle it. But we should um, ask Rob I, about that. I'm overly yeah. stereotyping, but uh, I'm I'm yeah. I, I'm sure like Rob uh, can pitch in on that as well. But uh, just quickly to finish um, on the private side, and um, Rob also mentioned about private equity leverage buyout. Is there's a lot of quantity numbers and as well. But um, if you really work on the job, be it a VC or gross equity or private equity, you need to be able to deal with the actual portfolio management companies. Not everything are gonna go well. Sometimes you need to reshuffle the management teams. Um, it's, it's not just about helping the companies. Sometimes you need to be able to deliver a tough conversations. You may not be able to back their additional round. You may have to change leadership or even swap co-founder. Uh, are you able to deliver that uh, uh, when the opportunity presents itself? So it's much more about, um, I guess, uh, relationship driven and also handling tough mm -hmm. conversations and being able to deliver um, with, with gravitas uh, and 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 um, uh, being able to handle situations uh, at, mm -hmm. at dire dire moment. So personality does play a role in those professions down the road. <laughs> well, like Rob, 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 you're not. You didn't change on me, did you? You're not private equity. You're you're trading. I, I know you don't trade everything, but you're right in with your monthly results and everybody's looking at your bottom line, at least I am, when you send me your reports. So tell us about your, your life and how you feel about that, I think. Look, we do mostly vast majority of work on the public equity side, but I, did find, I, I do come from the private equity side and really we model the Warren Buffett approach you know, again, from Warren Buffett's perspective, he doesn't view, he doesn't really care about all these different definitions, private, public. He's simply pursuing the best risk reward, you know, given the knowledge he has. If the best opportunity on the private side, he'll go after that. If the best opportunity on the private side, he'll go after that. And that's why in our portfolio, majority are public traded stocks that you and I, everybody can buy in the world. But sometimes we'll go activist and that relates to, the deal work that Daniel talked about, how you build a relationship with management team and, and with the board and convince them that there's a better way, that even though you're an outsider, that there's a better way to run their business, how you convince them that you actually know better than them how to run their business or pushing for a deal, pushing the company to be to spun off, to be sold. And we involved in a bunch of those in the past. You know, we pushed the Avon to be sold to Matura in Brazil. We've in, been involved in the uh, Yum China spinoff from Yum the Parent Co here in the US. And we're involved mm -hmm. in another activist situation right now with Vistas, which is the second largest uh, uniform rental and fleet management company um, in, in the US. So you know, going back to the Trash's question, you know, what personality you need for these type of wars. I would say, am I gonna focus, I'm gonna focus on LBL and uh, public equity. LBL is really about, you gotta enjoy doing the deal work. And in the, the day is about doing deals. And are you a person that like to do deals? And that's really, that's really the key. I've never seen a person that does not like doing deals in the LBO world because you gotta talk to the funding partners, the banks, the company. Um, you know, structuring that deal because that's, you know, again, these companies don't change a lot. You're not investing open AI that's going to, you know, dramatically change the world. No, you're investing very boring, all sexy business doesn't change in this like 10, 50, 100 years. So the company don't change a lot. So how do you make money? It comes down to the deal or structuring the right deal. 
so you can get you can you can juice up the return for yourself and the investors. But now, that takes public, more imagination, then, right? Then for sure, for sure, there's creativity going to that as well. Now on the public side, you know, then you mentioned this as well. It's really about your ability to handle pressure. And what I mean, well, when I talk about handle the pressure, is for yourself, meaning that, you know, oh, because the market came down or my stock went down, I cannot eat, I cannot sleep. That's one part. The other part is about that you don't show. So the best people in the public equity market, they're typically not very emotional. Um, and you can call them psychopath, but, uh, you know, that's that's actually a strength because, you know, like the best, uh, you know, the best investor in the public equity world, you walk into his office and you cannot tell from her face or his face whether his portfolio is up or down. Like that's the best situation. You cannot tell from the face whether he's making money or losing money. That's very, very critical mm. for the public equity market. Um. Let's see. I th I guess one of the last questions before we go to open it up, questions from the attendees is, um, if you don't stay in the profession until your um, retirement, um, have you seen what are the exit strategies? Have you seen amongst your colleagues, or is everyone just stayed? <laughs> are very oh, you happy know, interestingly, I, I went to a. Uh, party for a friend who, who was celebrating his 70th birthday and um, lots of his friends were or hedge fund guys or private equity. Um, the uh, half were retired and half were running a family office, their own family office, basically. Um, I, I think the, which is a good thing, I'm seeing more and more uh, uh, awareness of um, the need to stay involved, engaged, uh, and, and it might be your own thing, but be involved and engaged in what's happening in the world, which then goes, if your whole background is investing, uh, you can create something that has an economic consequence, which gives you the uh, fuel. So um, the uh, among the people I know, uh, they don't exit. They keep on uh, doing. Now they they if they were are smart, which they are. They they do have groups that continue working, and and the groups might take most of the uh, the equity, but they get to put their money beside the groups that they grew and so forth. So, I think the most successful and and interesting and involved people are never leave the business. My partner who was in. Uh, uh, over at uh, a traditional shop, Merrill Lynch, uh, he's all of 84. And and uh, he's as engaged. And of course, if you, you have the luck of being engaged, but he's as engaged in, in uh, as Don, you put out, do, do, or uh, Rob said, doing deals. He loves doing deals. Anytime he gets he gets alive when he's in the midst of negotiating a deal. But anyway, that's sorry, it was a long answer to a short question. But all right, well, let's see if there are questions from the attendees here. Um, okay, the first one: Given recent economic fluctuations, how have your investment strategies adapted in response to market volatility? Anyone want to take that? Rob? Well, I, I would say this is very unique to how we run, you know, our <laughs> investment business. Um, you know, you know, other funds, other strategies will change uh, pretty frequently, pretty dramatically. You know, it depends on what's the flavor of the day, the big themes in the market. We are more Warren Buffett type of investing. So regardless of the economic condition, we stick with, you know, our our, our mantra, our philosophy, really care about companies that generate good cash flow, that can perform, you know, in various economic conditions, that have management team that think like investors, that are aligned with shareholders, um, that we feel comfortable um, just like sharing the journey with them for, 
uh, for longer period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, so for us, the macro volatility, uh, you know, is a is a source of volatility, but you know that's not our biggest concern. Uh, you know, our biggest position right now, Micron. We built a position more than two years ago for forty. There's so many drawdowns, meaning the the company's like value came down 20, 30, 40 percent in the last like two years, or at least went through three or four times of that. Um, but we're we're totally okay with that. That's part of the that's part of the journey, that's part of the job. And uh, you know, as long as we think the company's micro fundamentals are still in place, our investment thesis does not change. Will not be shaken out by the uh, the overall macro economy. Okay, um, let's see the next one. To all the panelists, how has index investing affected the finance industry? I do think ETF is a great business. Like passive investing is a great business. The trend really started. Um, back in 08, 09, uh, in the middle of the last financial crisis. Uh, and my former employer, BlackRock, um, some of you might know, acquired BGI, Barclays Global Investors, was one of the pioneers in both scientific act, um, active investing as well. ETFs, um, they uh, acquired the whole company of BGI and become uh, one of the biggest uh, presence of um, passive investing. Um, so today known as iShares, but there's also uh, Spider and also Vanguard has its own offering as well. It's not just um, S&P and kind of NASDAQ, QQQ. Uh, there's also different styles of ETFs at this point. Uh, could be factor-driven, could be theme-based. So there's many different ways for you to take advantage of uh, passive opportunities without necessarily um, paying the typical hedge fund fees. Um, I've seen in family offices and other institutional investors their um, foundational allocation to public markets might be achieved by simply allocating to passive mandate or ETFs um, mm -hmm. because the fees are typically much more friendly and they can still get market beta. It's more and more important for true hedge funds to be able to prove that they're generating alpha or more absolute return oriented uh, or is providing some sort of uncorrelated return profile that is more consistent mm -hmm. uh, regardless of uh, market beta. So I do think um, the growth of um, uh, index and passive investing uh, have given uh, both institutional investors and retail investors a easier and more cost-effective way of particip participating in market beta. But if you really want differentiated alpha and uncorrelated consistent returns, uh, going for traditional hedge fund uh, or seeking more specific active mandates, uh, or if you want to access emerging markets um, where um, passive mandates may not necessarily give you the best result, mm -hmm. um, people will still go go for active uh, opportunities. Okay. Um, I have a sort of a practical question for uh, students. I mean, do you, like the big banks, they hire uh, people to, out of college and then will they, or do they require you to have an MBA first? Or how does that um, how did that career path go? The, the we we I think more and more of them are hiring out of college. Why? Because the the value of the MBA program, uh, uh, they can replicate uh, much more efficiently. Plus, you can grab talent, make it work hard. Uh, earlier before it becomes overpriced and then it might leave you, but you get into the cycle. Um, the uh, uh, We don't require an MBA. Uh, we really don't care. We would prefer if you went to one of the big shops and went through the training, that would be fine. But in, in what we do, including in private equity, where you need to know about companies, um, the, MBA is is not uh, and in the hedge fund side, MBA in in many of the trading act activities irrelevant. We'd rather see you have a CFA and pass the three legs of the CFA exam, uh, and uh, if you if you do that, 
we think you probably are technically better th than uh, the standard MBA. But for some of the, the you know, the finance oriented MBA programs or the quantitative MBA programs like Wharton or Chicago, so forth. But, but um, now in private equity, because of the networking and everything else, uh, you know, if you have a Stanford MBA and you happen to be out in the Bay Area, the, you may get a preference. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Rob, you just got your, you had your MBA from Columbia. Is that right? Have you found that yeah, helpful? So in terms of like, you know, our hiring practice, I agree with Greg, it's really about, you know, I think these days it's less, less so about education. It's really about, uh, you know, what's your value add to the firm? You know, and when I started my career, like, it was like more than 10, 15 years ago, there's a very standard path. Let's say you want to work for a hedge fund. You got to put in your time, your two years in, in this banking. And then guys, you spend your time, two years, two to three years in private equity before the hedge funds can will even consider interviewing you. We're talking about the hedge funds that is more like a, the Tiger or Warren Buffett type of style. Um, you know, obviously fast forward today, that requirement has been relaxed a lot more. Not necessarily, you know, I would say the industry does not care about the training anymore. I mean, the industry, they still do care a lot about the training that you, you put in your time in private equity, you put in time in this banking, and now you join, uh, you know, on the public equity side, doing the Warren Buffett style type of investing. It's more about the competition from the other fields, especially from tech, from startup. Why was why graduate from 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 Yale? It's like you know whatever fifteen years ago. The entire computer science department in my class of twelve hundred people, I think it's like 20, 20 less than definitely less than twenty five people. Today, there's like I think the number probably like triple or more than triple. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Back then, very few people, you know, I was looking at my classmates, nobody goes to the tech industry. Nobody thinking about, oh, let me go work for Google or Facebook. I mean, Facebook was still a very young firm back then, but nobody thinking about working for NVIDIA or Apple or, or Google. Everybody's like going for finance or consulting. Mm -hmm. Today, if you go, go back to campus, Wall Street uh is no longer the, the 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 top priority for the students most of the students at least, at least like the students we talk to they don't want to go to wall street anymore they want to go work for open ai they want to do their open uh, their ai startup everybody want to yeah. do the startup so i think that that has changed the supply which forced the investment management industry to to really to relax their you know a lot of requirement because otherwise you know, nobody want to work for the industry anymore. Everybody going to 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 Silicon Valley to do AI startups. Right, 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 right. And Danya, has that been your experience? Yeah, definitely agreed. I, I think Wall Street is competing for talents with Silicon Valley and tech jobs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, not, not necessarily relaxing standard, but just um, kind of understand where the the pay scale and kind of um, providing a little bit more friendly hours uh, to even entry entry level candidates um, uh, are are some of the benefits that probably um, years ago it wasn't even on the table. Uh, but but I do mm -hmm. think um, the the growth of AI uh, and um, some of the bigger shops, Nvidia, OpenAI, um, there's a way to approach the tech market uh, with the investment career paths uh, and investment lens as well. So you can join a VC uh, or even while you're still at college or grad school to become a scout at one of the uh, VC shops um, or um, as a public equity investor, you can still invest in Magnificent Seven or try to identify the next mm. big tech giant. Uh, from a VC perspective, you can also uh, mm. invest in AI uh, as a theme uh, or software or deep tech or biotech. Mm -hmm. So there are many different right. ways of uh, engaging the tech community without necessarily do a startup or join a startup yourself, that there's still a way to look at it from an investment perspective. Uh, although it may not necessarily be a, a typical Wall Street career, uh, you might need to do a little bit more networking to be able to break into uh, a VC um, or, mm -hmm. um, uh, sorry, my background noise. Uh, uh, yeah, so, well. so I, I, would, I would just encourage um, any fresh grad or, or people still looking to have an open mind 
Um, and 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 I guess instead of instead of instead of just thinking about tech versus Wall Street or Silicon Valley versus New mm-hmm. York, um, and maybe think about uh, what 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 kind of uh, uh, activities on the jobs that you want to pursue, be it about yeah. dealing with numbers, dealing with people, right. um, kind of uh, reading more reports, uh, coming up with investment ideas, or try right. to source deals. Uh, so think about the uh, actually uh, talk to alumni like ourselves and, and right. understand the actual right. activities of a specific career. Uh, right. That that might be helpful. Okay. Well, we've we've actually we've gone a minute over our hour, but I would like to thank all the panelists. Greg, Rob, and Danye for your expertise and your participation. Um, For anyone who um, didn't hear Peter at the very beginning, we are having an advisory and networking event on October 21st, um, starting, I think it's uh, 8 p.m. to 9 p.m., where uh, Yale alumni who are veterans in their professions will be sitting at tables, and it's a virtual event, and you can engage with them directly and um, ask them, you know, questions that uh, for your personal um, career path, or if you're searching for a new career path, they'll be available. So please sign up for that, and we'll be emailing everyone uh, a link for that. But thank you all, and thank you for uh, participating. And we'll see you hopefully October 21st. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.